It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The Obama administration has officially expanded its war against al Qaeda to include Somalia's al Shabaab, the piece of legislation that gives the president authority to do this without discussion or debate in Congress, is couched in the authorization of use of military force, also known as the AUMF, which has originally uh, passed by Congress on September 14th, two days after 9-11. The law granted authority to the president to target those the president determined had planned, authorized, or committed or aided in the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Al-Shabaab did not exist in 2001, and no connection has been proven between the country of Somalia and the attacks on September 11th. On to discuss all of this and much more, and particularly looking at what these expansionary powers have meant under President Obama and will mean under President Trump is Larry Wilkerson. Larry is the former chief of staff for U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell, currently an adjunct professor of government at the College of William and Mary and a regular contributor here at The Real News Network. Good to have you with us, Larry. Good to be here, Charmini. So, Larry, give us a sense of what these expansionary powers under AUMF was meant to have, and is it being uh, exploited under President Obama and possibly under President Trump? I think so under President Obama. I remind you, uh, back in the days of Donald Rumsfeld and the very first reactions of the United States post 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld and the Pentagon in particular tried to reinsert U.S. forces or U.S. influence everywhere in the world they could under the auspices of the AUMF and 9-11, uh, more importantly, as far as the American people were concerned. We even classified Abu Sayyaf, basically a bunch of thugs in the Philippines, as perhaps al-Qaeda connected and began to try and reinsert U.S. forces in the Philippines and were successful. So this is an excuse, if you will, a motivation, a reason for the United States to do things wherever it feels like it has to do them, whether it is in regard to al-Qaeda, that original striker of the United States, or whether it's just ancillary interests maybe associated, or whether it's just totally different interests. And I would submit to you that we will keep on doing this because presidents, once they have the power to do things like this, never surrender that power. Right. And um, you were uh, having problems with this initially when it was passed, but un that was under President Bush. Now, under President Obama, you thought things would be different. In which ways has he uh, used these powers, and has it been uh, contained or not? In terms of using the powers, I think we've seen their extension into everything from domestic issues like whistleblowers and uh, unprecedented uh, persecution of whistleblowers uh, to what you just referred to, an extension of the conflict such as it is in the countries where we have not got a declaration of war. We've not made any public statement about being at war with whatever constitutes the government of that country, in this case, Somalia. Um, we've done it across borders without identifying to anyone, including in most occasions to our own Congress and certainly the American people, that we're doing so and that we are, in effect, declaring war on that country, at least from the sky with drones and so forth. So this is an entirely new regime of power that we've opened up to a presidency that is already, as I discussed in seminar today with my students, already centralized most of its power inside the White House, inside the NSC staff and the NSC itself, and is exercising imperial power in many respects in ways that the uh, writers of the 1947 National Security Act, indeed the heirs of the power we accumulated post-World War II, never dreamed of. Uh, people like Dwight Eisenhower and Harry Truman uh, are rolling in their grave at the powers that we have just ipso facto, granted to the president of the United States, particularly under the auspice of uh, the war power. It's unprecedented what we've done, and I think we're going to pay for it dearly down the road. 
And we, we may well be getting ready to see how dearly we're going to pay for it with the most inexperienced team that's ever come to the White House, with a person who has lied his way into the White House, and with a team around him uh, and the chemistry and sociology of the team making these decisions, advising these decisions, that is probably going to be unique in American history. Uh, I, I searched my memory uh, all the way back to Andrew Jackson and pigs and chickens in the White House, as it were. I can't find anyone uh, who even remotely resembles this particular president-elect uh, or remotely resembles the team he's assembled around him. I think we're going to see the proof of the pudding in this presidency. I think we're probably going to see it within the first 18 months. And in terms of this type of legislation, obviously targeted at a particular time in the U.S.'s history um, to deal with al-Qaeda, uh, is there any way of, uh, you think it's very difficult for a president to give up these powers, but is there any way that legislatively could be uh, undone? Well, there is. Uh, the Congress had, could simply uh, repeal the act. And it could pass a resolution or even better, a statute that would, uh, uh, as they thought the War Powers Resolution did, but certainly did not, somewhat curb the president's ability to use the war power anytime in any place and against anyone whom he feels it needs to be used against. It's about time we did something like that. Let's look at what we've done, really. We, we have given the powers that the founding fathers, from Hamilton to Jefferson to Jay to Washington, you name it, all agreed was the most dangerous power of all and the one most conducive to tyranny to the president in an almost unquestioned way. The war power, of course, is what I speak of. And now we're giving it to a president for whom lying is an act of fealty, almost, to whom um, a selection of his team has seemed an almost happen chance thing, and whose team members, such as they are at this point, both confirmed and uh, uh, talked about, look as if they might be the worst possible decision-making team ever assembled in the White House. And that's saying something, because we've had some really bad ones. So here we have this coincidence of an enormous increase in presidential power, particularly with regard to the war power, one might say the ultimate power, the power to send young men and women to die for state purposes and to kill others for state purposes. And we've now given them to an individual who is utterly inexperienced and as everything I've just described and more, and we're going to sit back and watch what happens when we've done this. This is really frightening, Charmony. It is frightening times. Let's not forget, too, that some years ago I was called over the hill to talk to a couple of Republican congressmen who were very concerned about something that had just happened. And what had just happened, and, they, and, and according to these congressmen, there were only five members of the Congress, Senate or House, who objected to this. That'll tell you something. What happened was they removed the restriction on the U.S. Armed Forces being used within the continental United States to um, protect the country from, quote, material support to terrorism, unquote, whatever that ambiguous phrase actually means. So we now have the potential for the president of the United States to use the armed forces of the United States domestically. Think about that for a moment. Even scarier times. Um, we will think about it and follow this issue. Uh, Larry, I hope uh, you let us know when we, you think um, we should cover this issue again. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Charmaine. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.